Hey guys, hey. how are y'all? Hey. Hey, excellent, I'm, I'm doing fine, thank you very much. Yes. Our resident <laughs> comedian here, yeah. Um, don't heckle me, by the way. <laughs> Uncool, man. Okay, um, well I'm really pleased to uh, talk at this because craft is a subject that's near and dear to me and it has been for my whole career. Um, so I thought the first thing I should do is just write craft at the beginning of my presentation, which I designed in Keynote, um, because I'm also lazy. <laughs> and Keynote lets me do things quickly uh, without you know, too much stress. But then I, I typed this out, and I thought, oh, Jesus, this is a discussion about craft. And there's probably going to be people that are aware of typesetting in the audience. So <laughs> I'm kind of fucked. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, you guys can't see any of this, so you should definitely sit there, because this is going to be entertaining. Mostly because I'm making fun of myself. Um, so I type this out, and this is what I see. Uh, oh, by the way, just incidentally, uh, this typeface is Futura. Uh, Futura was designed by um, Paul Renner in 1927, and it was sort of a modern take on sans serif typefaces, which up until that point had been based on uh, sign writing. So there was a lot of really condensed uh, single stroke sort of letter forms. And this was sort of a modern, a modern take on a sans serif typeface. And it was done for modernity's sake and to, to, to provide some sort of like current, uh, you know, some current feelings to things that kind of needed that. So it's a great typeface. And it's, incidentally, it's the typeface that Volkswagen used on their ads in the late 50s and early 60s, which is largely considered the beginning of creative advertising and why uh, most of us are sitting in the, in the seats that we're sitting. Um, it it, it uh, was the birth of a whole industry and a creative revolution. So that's the reason I chose Futura. And we'll see a little bit more about this later. But as I type this out, what I see when I look at this is this. So these are my, my typesetting notes if I was going to send this back to a traditional type house. You could drive a truck through here. Um, <laughs> This is touching, which I don't mind, but it doesn't sort of answer the overall aesthetic of this, the way this is set. This definitely needs some space taken out. That's pretty good, don't mind that. Um, so I reset it, I went into, I figured out how to change the spacing between all of the letters in, in, uh, in the program, which is a bit of a bitch because you have to open a, a submenu and every time you do it, the submenu closes. So it's not, not a great art director's tool. But I reset it and I think you can see it's an improvement. The C and the R may be a little wide, but I can go back, though, and fix this. <laughs> so then I turn it upside down, because actually, this is the best way to look at display type if you want to see the spaces between the letters, because you're no longer looking at the letters, you're looking at the spaces. So, and that's really what tracking and kerning and all that stuff is about. So I turn it upside down, and I'm, yeah, it's pretty good. But again, I can go back to this anytime I want. And there we go. So that's the before and the after. Pretty good. <laughs> but then I did that, and I'm like, well, now I'm really fucked, because there's about 20 more slides that have a lot more type, and I'm going to have to go back in and do this every single one. And the reason, <laughs> the reason I do this, and the reason that this is in my brain when I set type is because this is where I come from. This is the foundation of my craft. Um, I was taught very early on that God is in the details. And those spaces between the letters matter. Even though the average consumer might not see the space between the letters, the overall spacing will communicate something about that piece that communicates something on behalf of a brand. So all of these little things are super, super important. Um, and that's kind of what it means to be a creative professional. I mean, I could not care about that. I could just type it out. But I'm from the school that says the, the details matter. And the details are what add up to a bigger thing. And I think for brands that especially suffer from lack of budget or 
uh, are, aren't sort of in, as competitive with, with the dollars that they have, those decisions become critical. Um, this was what I, this was my school. So this is how I learned to cut pipe. This wasn't that long ago. Well, I don't think it was that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a gray beard when I was doing this, so maybe it was a long time ago. But this is, uh, this is how I learned to cut type. So this is where I, I learned all of the things that matter. I worked for art directors who were designing ads. I was an assistant art director. My job was to set the type for their ads. So I wasn't coming up with ideas. I wasn't uh, presenting to clients. I was stuck over a drafting table. And I was using a knife and I was using rubber cement thinner to cut letters apart and move them and re-stick them and make sure they didn't move and showing it to the art director. And then the art director would say, eh, it's a little tight overall. Open it back up, which means you go in between all of the letters and you move every single letter by hand and you open the space up and you take it back to the art director and he says, eh, I think I liked it a little tighter. <laughs> and then you go back and you do it all over again. Eventually you learn not to do some of those and when the art director says, I thought I told you to make it looser, you say, oh yeah, you did, but then you told me to make it tighter. So you lie, basically. <laughs> so this is, this, is how, this is how I became used to the fact that, that these small things were going to matter. The goal of setting type for, at the time was to do what the art director said, but also to pay attention to what the, the, client, the, the client needed. So the, ad, the ads would, would convey an overall effect for that client. And the type was only just a part of that. So this is a true story. This is a hard lesson learned early on, but I think it was one that really stuck with me. I was working on the Honda dealership in New England, was a, a client of ours, and I was asked to set a zero and a percent next to each other because they had a zero percent you know, financing promotion, and this was gonna be a tent card that went on top of the car in the dealership. So a big you know, paper, paper tent, and it said that on it. So I was like, oh, okay. So uh, he said, give it, you know, do it, design it, give it a look. And I was like, okay, give it a look. <laughs> so I just, I set the type and I put a border around it. I wish I, had a, I wish I had a copy of it, but I don't. I put this border around, this blue border around it. I thought it looked nice. And I presented it to the art director and he looked at it and he looked at me. This is a true story. And this was like terrifying for me. And he looked at me and he said, why are you here? <laughs> and I said, oh, because, uh, I need you to approve this. And he said, no, why are you here at this agency? And I didn't know what to say. <laughs> and I think I might have almost cried at that point. <laughs> and I said, uh, what do you mean? And he said, if you're here to do what we do, it's all about caring. And if you can't care, then you shouldn't work here. And I was shocked. I was like, what is this crazy man talking about? <laughs> and he said, and you could tell I didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, you just type that out. So by this time, we were using computers, and I was presenting layouts in printed form, and I had typed the zero out, and I typed the percent out as it came out of the, 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 you know, the computer, uh, the program at the time, and there was a relationship that was established by the typesetting mode in the computer, right? So I just typed it out. And he said, I want you to go back, and I want you to think about that relationship between the percent and the zero, and I want to see some options. <laughs> options on zero in the percent. <laughs> like how many fucking options can there possibly be? So I go back to my office and I sit down and I think about it and I think I start to think about all of the things that I've been taught by all the other art directors in setting type and doing layouts. And I thought, oh well maybe maybe it's because the percent I set didn't didn't line up with anything. And I know that's good practice. Like things should line up and, and be more organized. Um, Maybe it's the size, the size of the percent was really big. Um, and the importance of this is the zero. So maybe if I divide the space up into a half or into a third, and I, I place that percent on the third mark or on the half mark in relationship to the zero, maybe I can show them some versions of that. So I went back into his office and I had probably 10 versions of different sizes of the percents related to zeros. And he said, what do you think? And I said, oh, I think this one. And he said, I agree, let's do that. And that was, the, that was it. That was the last time we spoke about <laughs> why I was there. <laughs> but it was really important for me to understand that. And the, the lesson there was, it didn't matter what this said. What mattered was my job was to care about those two elements. Because if I could care about those two elements, 
I could care about five elements. And if I could care about five, I could care about 10, and so on and so forth. So this was the fundamental lesson that I learned about craft, is that that, that detail matters to somebody, and it should matter to me as a creative professional. And it's a matter of being a pro. So the, the, the lesson here is you have to care. And craft is all about care. If you don't care, that's fine. That's a whole other kind of advertising, by the way. Um, <laughs> I tend to think that we're in the care, the care part of advertising. Um, so that, that was the beginning, that God is in the details. And that was sort of drummed into me. And everything was important, and every decision mattered. I guess the question is, uh, why? Like, why does craft matter? And why are details so important? For me, in my, my experience, and I think in a lot of our experiences, the details that make up something are the craft. And the details are more than just the little things. They're actually the glue that, that bond an experience to your brain. So think of anything that makes an experience, right? So let's say restaurants, for example. Who likes, who likes eating? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> Restaurants are, are a great uh, example of this. Um, Toro, for, who's been to Toro in the South End? Who's had the, the street corn? In fact, right? So I go to Toro for the first time and I have this corn. And if for those of you who never had street corn, it's, it's like a life-changing experience. <laughs> it's this perfectly sweet little corn. It's charred, like with the husk off. So it gives like a charred flavor to the sweetness. And then it's covered in this like mayo that's got garlic and lime and a little bit of chili in there. And then it's sprinkled with cotija cheese, which is super salty, kind of like a feta. And you eat this and it's like everything at once. It's crunchy, it's salty, it's sweet, it's creamy, it's spicy, and it's all over your goddamn face. <laughs> By the end of it. And you wipe it off and you go back in. <laughs> And you try to get the last one, and you offer it to the table, hoping that no one will say they want it. And then you eat it, and then you go home, and that fucking thing is stuck in your head. That corn is stuck in my head when I leave there. And that's an experience. But the experience isn't the restaurant, necessarily. It's not even the dish. It's all of the little things that happened to me when I ate that dish. That's an experience. And advertising is no different from anything else. What we're trying to do is create an experience on behalf of a brand. So people have more than just information that they get. They have something to feel something about and something to hook into their brain and, and glue those memories into their, into their brain to make you come back or to make you buy or to make you think or to make you talk or whatever that is. Ultimately, the details and the craft are what makes us feel something. And that's what great advertising does is it makes you feel. Okay? so. The lesson, craft is definitely about sweating those details. They have to matter if you want to do the job well. And the difference between the details and caring and not caring is the difference between advertising and creative advertising. And this goes back to the beginning. So who knows Bill Bernbach? People familiar with this guy? So Bill Bernbach is largely considered the father of creative advertising. He's the guy that, uh, pushed for this notion that ideas can sell and, I, and, and ideas can create feelings that connect people to brands and will sell more than a lack of ideas. This quote, let us prove to the world that good taste, good art, and good writing can be good selling, was actually from a letter he wrote to his agency directors at the time. He was working for Gray Advertising in New York. And he saw the change in his business go more towards research and more towards the science of, of, of communicating and advertising. And he said, Ar advertising is not a science, it's an art. And you can't measure that art um, because it's a lot of it exists in your gut. So that notion of having good taste as opposed to doing advertising that was crash, uh, crass and loud and, and you know, braggadocio was nothing, he wasn't interested in that. He was interested in creating things that were artistic and things that were well, well, you know, well articulated and things that were beautiful. Even in the writing, like I think a lot of people think, well, you know, craft is all about the art and the design. But craft is equally as in the writing. If you if you're, if you're all care about your writing, you know that writing is not just about writing to about something, it's about talking or it's about communicating. And especially in advertising, the, the, way, the way we write, hopefully, is a lot less uh, 
sort of um, formulaic and, 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 and strict, and it's more about being effusive about something or being educational about something or having someone, again, sort of feel something. So these are the words of the guy who basically started our business. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's always interesting for me to go back and look at some of those examples. So here's a bit of a history lesson for you. So this is, the, have you guys seen this? Yeah, so this is literally the start. Like they had done Volkswagen ads before this, and there were all kind of versions of things that ended up being like this, but this is it. This is the start of our business. This is the start of anything, anyone who works in this building is, is probably here largely because of this ad. And when you look at the ad, it's really simple. It's, uh, there's not a lot going on, um, but if you look at it compared to ads of the time, these were car ads of the time, right? Very traditional layout, three columns, uh, dominant visual area on the top, an illustration of the car because at the time, printing was a bit of a difficulty with photography and the separations for the magazine weren't as easy to do. So illustration was the preferred method because you could create a much more beautiful picture out of it because it's a lot simpler in a way. Um, and then this headline, the most beautiful thing that ever happened to horsepower with a subhead that says, it steals the show wherever you go, the long, clean, powerful 1958 Edsel. Like it, it feels like an ad. It feels like a corporation speaking. There's nothing familiar about it. There's nothing interesting about it. It just sort of is a, a company bragging about itself. By contrast, if you look over here, you see the car jammed into the upper corner, and you see a somewhat similar layout, which is actually interesting. The choice to do this layout was pur purposeful because this was a familiar layout in car advertising. So they chose something familiar only to, to use it to do something unfamiliar. That's genius, and that's, that's craft, and that's detail. So here it is. There's the car stuck up there. Forces you to look at it. You can't ignore it. It's more about the negative space than it is about anything else. But then when you look at the copy, this copy is set in a very non-traditional way. Although it's three columns, it's full of this. See these spaces here? This is very unorthodox typesetting. Um, these spaces are typically called widows and orphans, and they're things that you're taught to get rid of because they change the overall color of the type. So if you look back at this, for example, this has a much more even tone. It almost looks like a, a gray tone which theoretically is easier to look at. But what they were trying to do is use those, use those things that were typical to do things that are atypical. So these giant holes and these indented, every line is, in, every paragraph is in, indented, but some paragraphs are only a line long. They give sort of an approachable feeling and a feeling of imperfection to the whole layout. And that reflects the sentiment of the copy. Like when you read the copy, it's somewhat self-deprecating. So that imperfection, that self-deprecating quality the fact that this logo is stuck there, which is also unorthodox, it should be here, or it should take up the whole width of the column, according to good design practice, um, is, is unorthodox. But it, overall, it adds a feeling of approachability, right? And it adds a very uncorporate feeling to a car ad. And that's what the Volkswagen Beetle was. The Volkswagen Beetle was the people's car. It was cheap, it was uh, easy to maintain, it was less insurance, uh, good trade-in value. So that it was a car unlike any other car. And that ad, while it looked like a car ad in some respects, was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. And it caused a big stink. And that was the start of, the, of what we do. So when you look at that, you say, well, that's a really simple ad. But it's actually full of really small, big, big, important decisions that add an overall feeling to what that brand was trying to convey. And then if you look at every ad after that, they just get better and better and better and better. The concepts are better. The visuals are better. The copy is better. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to sort of go back and look at. Uh, and I think it still holds up, to be honest with you. I think you could run this today, and it would still be effective. So let's bring it forward a little bit. So I'm, I'm uh, the creative director on Jack Daniels uh, Tennessee Whiskey. I've had the, the great pleasure of working on that business for a decade. And I don't know many people in my position in the industry that can say that. Advertising has gotten far away from relationships and, and building brands together with agencies, unfortunately. Um, but this is not one of them. So. Uh, Jack Daniels is a brand that's, that's all about craft. 
A lot of people think it's sort of like this, you know, ubiquitous well whiskey. It's, uh, you know, like Jim Beam, things like that. But if you ever talk to the master distiller who brews, who, who, uh, uh, who works on Jack Daniels, who distills the product, he would tell you that if you think that Bullet Bourbon or if you think that Basil Hayden's or a lot of these smaller bourbon whiskeys are craft, they would talk about sort of the character of their whiskey and the, and the tastes that, that change from, from bottle to bottle. And what you're actually tasting, according to Jeff, who's the master distiller, is imperfection. He said, if you want to know what it's like to, to craft something, try crafting one whiskey for the world. So every bottle of this product comes from Lynchburg, Tennessee. Every single bottle of Jack Daniels comes out of there. And try to make that experience the same in Australia, and in Singapore, and in Iceland, and, and in New York City. That's, that's difficult, and that's a high degree of craft. And it's got a lot to do with the details. The corn that they, they use, the, the mash bill that they have, which is the relationship with the, between the corn rye and the barley. The water comes from a very specific place. The barrels that they put the whiskey in, the char that goes into that barrel, all of these little details add up to something that's a really high quality product. So fortunately for us, our job is to reflect that, that attention to craft in our advertising. Um, and one of the core tenets of, of Jack Daniels advertising is to execute like a craftsman. So they hold us to a standard and we hold ourselves to a standard of execution because it reflects well on the product. So in, uh, I don't know when this was, 2000 something, yeah, 2012-ish maybe, um, we started this campaign around the 4th of July because one of the other core tenets of Jack Daniels advertising is independence. So we started this uh, poster series around Independence Day um, and the strategy for this series was Jack Daniels stands with those who celebrate their independence. So our job as a brand, as, an, as, a, as a symbol of independence, is to sort of support those people who uphold their tradition and their trade and their craft. So we said, well, let's go out and create this, this series of declarations of independence. So this is one of them. So what we did was we wrote a bunch of sentiments about, about independence, in this case, uh, made in America because that's how America was made. Like, that's how we feel as a brand. And then we found people to execute these things in a way that they felt was important. So we picked artists based on the craft that they were upholding or a tradition they were upholding, which is in line with making whiskey and a craft and a, and a, and a recipe that's been passed down through generations. So there's a little film here. This is only two minutes. So uh, check this out, and then we can talk about that. Derek 
There you go. So that's Derek. So that, I mean, you know, that, that film is full of little choices. So the music is, uh, the music was selected because that, that's in Berkeley, California, and there's a specific sort of country music sound that came out of that. Um, the, uh, you know, the thing is just full of detail. Now, Derek's position on this is that, that, that uh, for him, in which aligns with the brand of Jack Daniels, is that craft is about upholding traditions. And, and while I think that's true, it's also not true in some cases. So I was actually having a good discussion about this yesterday. Someone was asking me what the heck I was doing today. And uh, I told him I was doing a discussion on craft. And he said, you know what you should talk about? You should talk about how Instagram has ruined photography. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, no one knows how to take pictures anymore, and you know, no one knows how to develop film, and blah, 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 blah. And while I agree with that in some respects, I also completely disagree with it. Because I think Instagram has given people that aren't technically savvy the tools to be craftspeople. And you see it all the time. I, I'm one of them, by the way. I suck at taking pictures. Like the worst photographer, I'm the laziest photographer, I have no interest in f-stops, I don't even <laughs> really know how any of that shit works together. <laughs> So what I do is shoot the bejesus out of something, I pick one that's closest to what I think it should be, and then I fuck with it. <laughs> and I put filters on it, and I recrop it, and I change the perspective, and then I f end up with something. And that's because I know what I want it to look like, and then who cares how I get there? I don't think it matters. So if you look at anything, especially new platforms for communication, whether it be Snapchat or Instagram, or Instagram Stories, or new Instagram TV thing, all of those just give people an opportunity to develop a craft in a different way. So while in some cases craft is about hands-on tradition, in other ways it's not about that at all. It's about what, what Derek said, which is make the best thing you can in the best way you can. Who cares how you get there? Um, as long as you care about those details and you care about the things that go into the overall piece, right? Um, what's this? Oh. This is one more, another Jack Daniels piece. Let me, let me show you this and then we can talk about this too. This is Lynchburg, Tennessee. This is how many people were born here. This is how many are fifth generation. This is how many are named High Waffle Kitty McGee. <laughs> These people have served their country. This is how many will still be in town when the football team plays at Hamburg. She's from Taiwan. He's German. This guy keeps the town dry. These guys would prefer a little wet. This man is ejected from an SR-71 Blackbird and went to tell about it. He can lift a 500 pound barrel of whiskey. These are the descendants of Mr. Jack Daniel himself. This is how many people are proud of what we do here. This is how many will go around bragging about it. This is our town, the home of Jack Daniels. If you can't get here, just look for one of our postcards. <clears throat> so this, this commercial is full of decisions. It's full of very small decisions that have a big dif make a big difference to the, to the spot. Um, this was one of them. We had concepted this and sold it to the client as a uh, commercial that would take place in town. So it would have their town hall behind it and all the people would come to the town center. So we worked with a director named Steve Miller, who probably most famously did all of the uh, most interesting man in the world stuff, which was also an interesting detail because when the, the creative director that works for me on this business suggested Steve Miller, I said, well, he's a comedy guy. And he said, yeah, but I think we need that. I think we need like a comedy sensibility to bring a touch of humanity to this and to find out where the quirky things are because the quirky things are what's gonna make this feel real and not like we're making fun of these people. And I thought, Jesus, that's smart. <laughs> I should work for you. <laughs> but I didn't say that. <laughs> and now he still works for me. Um, but when we worked with Steve Miller, we, we went into uh, one of the days after the pre-production, uh, toward the pre-production meeting after he did a location scouting, and he came with pictures of this field. And he said, we have to shoot this in the field. And we said, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Why should we shoot in the field? And he said, because a town is not the buildings, a town is the people. And we need to give a background for those people to live in that makes it all about the people. The people are the town, it's not the town. And then again, I was like, genius. <laughs> Why am I so stupid? 
And so he had this other detail. He said, you know what we'll do is we'll bring a row of chairs like they brought them from home. So we just went out and found all these chairs in town and brought them there. But the overall aesthetic gives it a feeling that's really focused on the people, and the people as being the, the heart and soul of that town. Uh, the chairs add that detail to it. The, the fact that we found um, Hiawatha Kitty McGee and said, put her on film, that adds to it. Um, the guy who uh, jumped out of an airplane, and literally like ejected out of an airplane and, and survived, he adds to that realness. The dog lives there. Um, I mean, this is, these are all real people. And these are all the things that we found. And we found 50, 60 more of these things. And then the job became, how do we pick the best ones? And that becomes an editorial exercise. Now you're into the editor part of this, and a good editor will add something, right? So that the director who said, let's change the background of this, that's a detail. And I think the important lesson here is don't be afraid to use someone else's idea if they make the idea better. It's not about my idea. My ideas largely kind of suck. <laughs> but I think when you work with the best people, and that, that's, everyone around you, everyone's got a, a good idea somewhere. And I think it's a matter of recognizing where those things are and how do they add to the whole. So never be afraid to, to sort of give up something to a better idea that adds, that adds a bigger dimension to what you're doing. Um, how are we doing for time, by the way? Two minutes, Jesus. I thought this would take 10. Let me skip forward here because there's one more thing I want to show you. Um, I'm going to show you two versions of this commercial, and then we're going to talk about why they're different. So this, this, this is the same commercial, but there's a big difference um, in, in the way this one is executed. So who, who knows the difference between those two spots? Well, say, say that again? You're looking at it versus you're in it, from the perspective. Uh, yeah, more or less, yeah. Um, anybody else have a, a different take on that? I, I'm assuming the camera angles were different, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, you probably all just saw the same thing. Kim, who was so trying desperately to get here, and she made it, I'm so proud of you. The words are exactly the same. Everything is the same except for the camera. So the first one was shot with a locked off camera and we watched that Jeep go from the, from the bank to up, to up the fall. The other one was a drone following that Jeep. Now the, the, the detail here that matters is we were trying to create something that was thoroughly unlike a car commercial. Because this ran on the Super Bowl. And the whole sentiment is basically saying Car companies have gotten used to listening to themselves talk, and it's all about platitudes and uh, you know, sort of big statements. 
Uh, and what we wanted to do was remind people what a Jeep is. A Jeep is a capable car, and that's what a Jeep does. Like, right, in, when you see a Jeep now, you mostly see it with tons of aftermarket shit on it. It's probably white. It's probably got, it probably doesn't have an ounce of dirt on it. And we wanted to remind people that a Jeep is a Jeep because that's what it's good at, right? So everything that we did was designed to reflect that notion that this is a car unlike every other. The commercial is unlike a car, a car commercial, at least modern car commercials. In some ways, it's an old car commercial. It's a product benefit spot. Um, but the decision to go with a locked off camera was simpler. And it was very, um, it was sort of unfancy. The drone shot is gorgeous. There's no question that's a great camera move. But the camera move is not important. What's important is the overall piece of communication on behalf of that brand. So that decision to do a locked off camera as opposed to a, a drone who does a beautiful move around this Jeep, like a total pro high-end drone thing, amazing to watch this happen. And the film is gorgeous. And myself and the director and the team, we debated this for a week because we love the drone shot. But at the end of the day, my decision was to go with the locked off shot because that is the best way to communicate what we're trying to communicate for that spot. So a lot of that is don't forget to separate your taste from what the job is. Because I think a lot of times as creative professionals, we bring our taste to the, to the job, which is great. But at some point, you have to remove yourself from, from what you're trying to do and make the right decisions on behalf of something else. That's, that's what being a, a professional is all about. Um, so anyway, that about wraps it up, y'all. Um, one thing I just want to remind people is craft is never the goal, right? Craft is the sum of the, is the parts that go into the whole. Um, I think craft is a, a thing to always shoot for and keep in mind while developing things, but ultimately craft is in service of something. In advertising, it's in service of an idea, and those ideas are in service of a business that's trying to do something, and those business goals are ultimately what that craft serves. Uh, so craft is, is definitely not the, the be-all and end-all. Um, and really, at the end of the day, craft in detail and attention to detail, it all comes down to do you care more? And if you want to be a standout creative professional and you want to be better than everyone around you, you just have to care more. And you have to believe that you care more. And, you have, and people have to know that you care more. Because when you care more, it's reflective in the choices that you make. And those choices that you make add up to something greater. Um, so anyway, thanks. Yeah.